Hey guys, welcome again to another video. And as always, thank you as always for tuning in and I really do appreciate it. Okay, so today's topic, before I begin, before I begin, you, I want to make sure, number one, that you have the time to watch this video in its entirety, okay? You cannot skip through this video, all right? I'm gonna try to be as brief and as fact-filled and give you as much information as possible. All, so we're gonna just jump right in. But if you do not have the time to watch this entire video and you are ready to jump in the comments just based off of the title, then I would ask that you would just not just content, go on to the next video. All right. Look for the, uh, the video with the, the dancing cats or something like that. Okay. Or whatever it is that you're going to watch next. But this video is one that you really need to make sure you watch from the beginning to the end so that you have all the information. And then from there, like with all of our videos, we are going to encourage you as the listener, as the viewer, to take this information and to go and do your own research and to do your own study and to compare it against what you have found. But what but do not go into your own studies just based just marking off everything that has been presented here. Because everything that we're presenting here is historically factual, okay? There may be some things that aren't included. It's just simply because maybe I didn't know. You, you understand what I'm saying? So, because we don't claim to know everything on this platform, but what we do is we gather what we do know, and then we do put it on a video or whatever and just uh, put it and put it before you. And um, that's kind of how we go. But, you know, but, you know, but if you're going to dismiss any of the findings in this video, please make sure that you come with facts. You come with accurate and related facts. I've done many videos where we will put things out and when and people will leave a comment on something, they will say, well, read Romans chapter two. And I'm like, oh, okay, what does that got to do with this? Well, I, I, you know, hey, listen, at the end of the day, the world, the, all the world was black at the beginning anyway. So we were all black in the beginning. OK, what does that got to do with anything? Well, the law says this. And then it's again, bringing up these unrelated points instead of addressing exactly what is being discussed in this video. So this is why we encourage you, just like with all of our videos, is to make sure that you take the time and you look, you listen to what's being presented, take that information and then you want to cross reference it to what other additional findings that you found. But like I said, again, what we're going to present today in this video is things that you can easily find on just doing a simple search and, um, and you can validate it on your own. OK. And um, and also I will add to that this particular video, I'm just going to let you know it is going to be one that's going to be quite challenging to numbers of people. Um, you're also going to have people who are going to pivot. They're going to find ways to pivot away from this information. And, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, truth is truth. Okay. So we're going to jump right into it. So today's topic is we're going to look at where did the word Bible come from? Where did that come from? You know, many times we, you, you know, you, me, others, you've heard us, you know, people say the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Have you ever thought about where that word actually came from? Well, today we're going to actually discover that. OK, so let's go ahead and um, I got a few slides here, but I'm, I have some other things, too. I'm going to show with you. So. So, like I said, again, how the Bible got its name. Now, it, I, this painting here, I've seen this painting and ever since I've seen this painting, I tell you, this is probably one of the most creepiest paintings I've ever seen. Uh, you know, I I. My wife and I ain't going to never be kissing any book. I, I ain't going to be kissing any book. Okay. And we ain't going to be kissing any book, especially like this. So when I saw this, I was like, yeah, because this this is I actually saw this in a painting. Well, I, I've seen it online, but it was a painting I saw on South Street in Philadelphia as well in some kind of art shop. And I was like, man, this is really weird. But. The thing is, is that you have a lot of people who view the Bible as just that. 
and not really knowing the people behind it, the people who actually wrote the Bible and the history behind it. And um, and that's what we try to do. And that's why in our series, the very series that we've done, again, go to our Linktree page, linktree.com forward slash um, journeyman and woman. And we've done series after series after series where we've actually explored the actual people behind the translation, the writing, the transcribing, the distribution of the Bible. And um, and once you start diving into that, I'm going to tell you, you're getting you're going to get a lot more information that your pastor, your uh, your youth pastor, <laughs> you know, uh, some of your favorite YouTubers. They're not going to touch because if they go too far with this, it's going to interfere with their platform and it's going to interfere, you know, in some cases may interfere with their money. But again, we here are about the truth and that's what we want. And um, and so, uh, you know, there are things that we have said and repeated on this platform for years and didn't even know. But now that we know we are course correcting and let and bring you on the process as we are course correcting on this journey here. OK. So anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. So today we're going to be talking about how the Bible got its name. All right. So first place to start is about Biblius, Biblis or Biblis. OK, what is Biblis? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Biblis, this is where the the word Bible originates from. But we're going to find out about what is Biblis. OK, so let me get out of this. Let me pull this up here. Give me just a moment. And we're going to find out about what this is here. All right. There we go. It's spelt different ways, but this is it right here. Okay. All right. So Bible is, it can also be, um, it's, um, pronounced or written or spelled, um, Byblos, Byblos. Okay. And Byblos is an ancient city in Lebanon. Okay. And so let's go ahead. And they said also known as Jabal. Uh, let's see, Jebelit, uh, Gubla, Jebel, Jub, um, Baal, and Kumda, oh, Kum, let's see, Kubna, all right, and I'm reading that all the way up here, all right, and this is where in the, um, Britannica, all right, it's right here, this is what I was just reading, okay, so now let's go ahead and get into it even more, all right, so we're gonna learn about this place, Bible's modern Jebel, um, also spelled Jubail or Jabil, biblical Jabal, ancient seaport, the site of which is located on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, about 20 miles north of the uh, modern city of Beirut, Lebanon. It is one of the oldest continuously inhabited towns in the world. The name Biblos or Biblos is Greek. And they say Papyrus received its early Greek name, Biblos or Biblo, Biblinos from its being exported to the Aegean through Biblos. Sent, or rather, hence the um, English word Bible is derived from Biblos as the papyrus book. Okay, so again, they're, they're telling you here. Hence, the English word Bible is derived, derived from Biblos as the papyrus book. So they're telling you that what we know today, the word Bible comes from this city. It comes from the name of this city here. Okay. All right. So let's continue to read on. We just learned a little bit about the city and we're going to go even deeper. Modern archeo archeological excavations have revealed that Biblos was occupied at least um, by the Neolithic period, the new stone age and then they give the dates 8,000 to 4,000 BCE, and that during the fourth millennium BCE, an extensive settlement um, developed there because Byblos was the chief harbor for the export of cedar and other valuable wood to Egypt. It soon became a great trading center. It was called Kum Kubna in ancient Egyptian and Gubla, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in Akkadian. The language of Assyria, Egyptian monuments in, in, and inscriptions found on the site attest to the close relations with the Nile River Valley uh, throughout the second half of the second millennium. 
During Egypt's 12th dynasty, 1938 to 1756 BCE, Byblos again uh, became an Egyptian dependency and the chief goddess of the city, Baalit. Okay, you, yes, we read that right. So this city called Byblos, Byblos had a chief goddess. All right. And some of y'all may have picked that up in some of those, you know, the different spellings of the, the name of, of the town. You know, you may have heard Baal in there. Well, yeah, it was Baal. It was named. The city itself is literally named after a Baal. Uh, we've talked about this in other videos. Baal isn't just one God or one deity. There's a whole family of Baal gods. There's a whole family of them. And this is just one of them. OK, so again, let's go back. Byblos again became an Egyptian dependency and the chief goddess of the city, Baalit, the mistress with her well-known temple at Byblos was worshipped in Egypt after the collapse of the Egyptian new kingdom in the 11th century BCE. Byblos became the foremost city of Phoenicia. All right. So the other thing, too, that I want to make sure. Um, we talked about um or we talked about the bales the other thing too is canaan all right so this area here i'm gonna try to make this kind of big here let me see if i can make it any bigger here on this map so you can see all right so where they're showing you right now is this is israel down here all of this israel and unfortunately i can't move down any further south if you if i was to move everything further south you'll see egypt down in this area right here but israel which according to the bible biblical account um this was the promised land all right and prior to it being called israel it was referred to as canaan and that's what the bible says however historically this was not it was canaan but canaan was also egypt it was also considered Egypt. OK, so when the Bible tells us that the children of Israel, they went to take over um, Canaan and they had to wipe all the people out or whatever. There is, first of all, there is no historical record of that even happening. That's number one. Outside of the Bible, there's no historical record of a group of people known as the Israelites um, taking over Canaan by act of war and all of that. OK. At least not yet. There may be something that will come up in the future, but historically outside of the Bible, you will not find that. OK, um, but this area here known today as Israel was at one time part of Egypt. It was known as the part of the new kingdom. It was a new kingdom period. And um, in this area right here, all of this was known as Egypt. Um, in one of our and I think who in the L are you following series? I think that's the series one of the um, um, installments in there, we talk about the the vast amount of Egyptian artifacts that they are still uncovering in Israel today. Um, and I'm not talking just a little coin or a little rock or anything like that. I'm talking about entire caves and uh, um, places where tombs, where bodies were <laughs> were buried, you know, in Egyptian, in the Egyptian way and all this stuff. So I'm talking about things that you can't even move. You know, a lot of Egyptian things that they have uncovered and still continue to uncover. Another thing that they're uncovering in have been uncovering in Israel as well is a lot of Phoenician uh, works. Phoenician. One day we're not going to get into it now, because when I tell you, once we really get launch into that, that's going to be a huge topic. We're going to talk about the Phoenicians and who exactly they were. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to be quite blown away <laughs> um yeah it, it, you're gonna be bl blown away at that okay but we're gonna we'll get into that soon but anyway um so yeah so biblos as you can see which they said this also at one time was part of egypt it was north of what we know today as israel biblos is right here this is where it's located okay so all of this was considered egypt and as we've said in other videos before the bible Mo a good portion of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament, which at that time was known as the Septuagint, was written in Egypt. So what we know today is the Bible was written all under the umbrella of Egypt. 
for the most part. You know, there are other parts in the um, in the Old Testament that was written in Babylon, um, you know, as well. So you got Babylon and then I might be some other place in there. I may be forgetting. But Babylon and Egypt, for sure, this is where the places where the Bible was written. And uh, so just wanted to kind of go over that. All right. So let me go back here. Uh, let's see. Let's bring this up here. The Phoenician alphabet was developed. You ever hear someone say, you know, spell it phonetically or say it phonetically? Well, that's where it comes from. Phoenician. OK, the Phoenician alphabet was developed at Byblos and the site has yielded almost all the known early Phoenician inscriptions, most of them dating from the 10th century BCE. By that time, however, the Sidonian kingdom with its capital of Tyre had become dominant in Phoenicia and Byblos. Through its, though it flourished into Roman times, um, never recovered its former supremacy. The Crusaders um, captured the town in 1103 and called it um Gib let's see Gibelet. um they they built a castle there using stone from earlier structures and were driven out by the Ayyubid sultan um uh, saladin in 1189 the town subsequently sank into obscurity okay so we don't have to read any more but one other part in here that um which i think is quite interesting is we're gonna i want to read this part here again up to here all right so it says the phoenician alphabet was developed at byblos and the site has yielded almost all of the known early phoenician inscriptions most of them dating from the 10th century bce by that time however the sidonian kingdom and then i'm gonna stop there dot 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 now isn't it interesting that if you go to a state in the United States, Arizona, you're going to find a, the capital, the state capital of Arizona is Phoenix, Phoenix. And another town that's north of Phoenix is Sedona. Isn't that interesting? Not a coincidence at all. It's not also a coincidence that um, a lot of the if you start, if you want to get into some of the archaeological findings, like in the Grand Canyon, they have found a number of things where you have a lot of people say, see, it's Hebrew. It's Hebrew all over the place here. This all Hebrew inscribed in, you know, in 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 um, in some of the rock formations and stuff like that. It's not Hebrew. It's actually Phoenician. And like I said, again, we're going to get into that. That's a whole nother topic we'll get into. But anyway, I think I thought that was very interesting. I want to bring that out as well. So let's go ahead and continue here. Um, let's go to Wikipedia. And again, I'm just showing you resources here that you can easily find on your own. And I would encourage you again to make sure you take this information and then you do your own additional research here. But if you're going to say that any of this is wrong, you know, or inaccurate, then the challenge is to you is to show factually that anything i'm saying here up to the, you know in this video is in fact that's the case because we're all going to sources here okay so let's go okay so um byblos um also known as Jab okay let's skip skip down here because some of it is repeating here okay um okay etymology let's talk about that Isubius um stated that byblos was known in hebrew as gabel or gobel gobel the name appears as Kem Kebni in Egyptian hieroglyphic records going back to the fourth dynasty, Pharaoh um, Sephiro, and as um, Gubla in the Akkadian cuneiform are, let's see, Amarna letters to the 18th, um, 18th dynasty, Pharaohs Amenhotep, Hoptep, the third and the fourth. In the first millennium BC, its name appeared in Phoenician and Punic inscriptions as Gabal. And then it goes on and it says in the Hebrew Bible as Geval, Jeval as G-E-V-A-L and the Syriac as, and then they spell it there, G-B-L. All right, let's see here. The name seems, now this is a part here I want you to pay attention to as well. The name seems to derive from well, 
and God. The latter, a word that would variously uh, refer to any of the Canaanite gods to or to their leader in particular. The name thus seems to have meant the well of the God or the source of the God. Did you hear that? So the word Bible or Biblios, the word Bible, which comes from Biblos, Biblos means the well of the God. Which God are they talking about? A Canaanite God. All right. And we're going to get into the spirituality part in a moment here. All right. So when you say Bible, what you're referring to is a Canaanite deity. All right. Uh, let's see here. All right. So a lot of this is these are things that we've some of the things we've already touched on here. Um, let's see. Egyptian period. This goes into Egypt and how, you know, some of this start um, bleeding into the Egyptian you know, culture as well. We kind of touched on that already. And there you go. So, so far, what we've learned again, I just like recapping because I want to make sure people are, tra um, are tracking with us. So, so far, again, what we've learned is that the word Bible comes from the word Biblos. All right. Biblos is referring to a Canaanite God. All right. It means the well of the God. That's what it means. So anytime you use the word Bible, because the Bible told me so I'm reading in the Bible. I need the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. When you say that, what God are you referring to? Hmm. Well, Ken, again, going to the facts, we're looking at the facts. OK, you cannot take. Well, I know what I really meant. OK, well, that's fine. But the but what you may mean does not change the facts of what we're talking about here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because there are a lot of people right now at this point in this video will hear this and dismiss it simply because you believe that your belief changes that. OK, it doesn't. I can believe all day that water is sand. OK, or sand is water. I can believe that I can speak to that sand and say sand right now. I command you to become water. I can com I command you to become water because I'm thirsty. Do it. Do it. I don't care what people say. And I'm like, oh, bro, 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 bro. Hold, 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 hold on. Why, why are you getting ready to drink some sand? Bro, this ain't no sand. This is water. This is water. Don't don't come up in here and see. Listen, I've been training for years and I'm telling you right now, this is water. I don't care what you say. And like, bro, hold, hold. So it doesn't matter. It's still sand. It's going to remain sand. No matter how many times you speak over it, it's still going to remain sand, period. So likewise, in this particular case, you can say all you want that, hey, listen, well, I believe it means something else. Well, you know, that's not going to change it. That's not going to change the facts. You understand? And then another thing that some people would do is try to say, well, that is when the white people took over and they changed it. Wait a minute. This is going back until the first time it was called Bible. We cannot treat history as some kind of uh, uh, all you can eat smorgasbord place where you can pick and choose the facts of history and kind of put it together like a Voltron. You understand what I'm saying? You can't do that. So if you're going to claim this thing, then you got to claim all of it. You understand what I'm saying? So that's why I said it's amusing to me when you hear uh, Christians out here who are saying that want to accuse like, you know, look at for Africa, for example, or talk about African spirituality and oh, your pagan gods and your goddesses. And you guys are out here worshiping dirt and worshiping trees and all this stuff. But the book that you hold dear the, to you, closest to you the most is named after a Canaanite god. Anyway, so let's go ahead and continue. I'm going to switch up to well, almost finish here. Like I said, it's not too much. Yet. That's why I wanted to give people. I wanted to jump right in on this one. All right. So now we're going to talk about the spirituality of Biblis or Biblios. OK. And uh, so we're going to talk about the spirituality of this area. All right. So let's go back 
And give me just a moment as I'm doing my switching around here. Because I think I had another slide I want to show you here. Hold on. Well, there's two two other things I'm going to show. These are just some extras. And then I'm, we're going to get into the spirituality. This is really quick here. All right, there we go. Yeah, I apologize. Um, this site wants me to take down my ad blocker, which I'm not doing. Okay, but this is uh, the website BibleHistory.com. All right, and I wanted to bring this to your attention because just to show that even people who, you know, defend the Bible, they acknowledge this. So this ain't just me coming up with this, but I'll just read it to you. All right, it says the Phoenician city of Jabal was named um, Byblos by the Greeks because it was through Jabal that papyrus, a uh, papyrus, I say papyrus, I'm sorry, I was um, pronouncing it wrong. Papyrus, um, uh, Bublos, let's see, Egyptian pap papyrus was imported into Greece. Hence, the English word Bible is derived from Byblos as the papyrus book. The um, present day city is now known at, by the Ar Arabic name of Jubail. There's that word, Baal, right? It's just spelled different. Or Jubil, a direct descendant of the Canaanite name Byblos or, or Jabal, the Phoenician, is located on the Mediterranean coast of present day Lebanon, about 26 miles, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then it says, it is mentioned in the Bible in 1 Kings 5.18, referring to the nationality of the builders of Solomon's temple and also Ezekiel 27.9, referring to the riches of Tyre. All right. So there you go. So, and then the other thing here, this is a Catholic site. Um, they talk about it as well. Uh, reason why I'm using them as a source as well is because Catholics are the, what we call the Catholic Church or Rome. They are the ones that gave us the Bible in the first place. And um, so they said, Biblos and the Bible, an ancient site in a small town in Lebanon holds the key to the scriptures. All right. And let me see here. I don't want to get too repetitive here. Let me see. I'm just scanning through here. Okay, let me let me just kind of go through this real quick. Okay, um, there is an ex there is an extensively um, excavated area in otherwise drab little town of Jabal, uh, Lebanon, a conglomerate array of ruined temples, castles, and prehistoric dwellings that stirs the imagination of those who read the guidebooks from the area or as fortunate enough to gaze upon the uh, panorama firsthand. In recent years, the ancient site called Biblos has attracted the attention of those interested in studying the scriptures in the light of new archaeological findings. For besides shedding lights on the early history of mankind in the Near East, Biblos has interesting associations with the Bible. Perhaps the most fascinating link is that through a long sequence of events spanning centuries, the very word Bible itself is came indirectly from this ancient Phoenician seaport. Uh, located about 20 miles north of Beirut, this historic commercial center is claimed to be the oldest continuously um, inhabited city in the world. Excavations undertaken since 1921 has unearthed ruins that date this Neolithic age from the Neolithic age as well as... The, okay, I'm going to skip here, okay? Um... Okay, let me go come down here. In time, the Greeks came to associate the product with its shipping port. So they gave the name Byblos to the pap, uh, papyri materials which had originated in Egypt. Later on, as single pages of papyri were glued together into rolls and bound, the word Byblos developed into the word Biblia, meaning books. According to Bible scholars, the Greek church fathers finally applied the word Biblia to the sacred scriptures in the 5th century AD. And from that point on, the holy book has been known as the Bible. Uh, all right, let me just read this here. Besides lending its name to the greatest book on, of all time, Biblos has continued uh, contributed much to the history of civilization in general. Interesting. 
undamaged by the most recent civil war, which has caused so much destruction elsewhere, Byblos continues to fascinate those who attempt to unravel the very long and complicated history of the Near East. As one writer has said, Byblos constitutes a sort of condensed history of Lebanon. And then it goes on. Okay, so there you go. So yeah, so um, quite fascinating stuff again. I think we've kind of established <laughs> very strongly here that this is the where the word Bible comes from. Okay, now let's go to the spirituality. Let's learn a little bit more about it. We, we, we heard a little bit about it, but let's learn a little bit more. Right now I'm on the website, um, bibliosruins.com. So they are all dedicated to studying and examining the ruins of this ancient city. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Okay, so it says the gods of Byblos, Baalit, Jabal, and Reshif. All right, so these are the gods of the Bible. I mean, Byblos. Okay, and um, here we go. Let's jump right into it, okay? So in this video, as you haven't noticed already, we're doing a lot of reading here, okay? And... Um, you know, so just bear with me as we kind of go through this. Each city in Phoenicia had a different form of worship and cultic pantheon. The cultic pantheon consisted of a two tier hierarchy um, comprising of a comprising a supreme male and or a female deity, a Baal or Baalat. And a lower tier included all other deities worshipped in the city. The upper tier was like like linked, sorry to the ruling dynasty. For example, in Byblos, Baalit, Jabal, the lady of Byblos was venerated and was associated with fertility, birth, and seafaring. In Byblos, in addition to Baalit and Rashif, it is said there was also an assembly of the holy gods, members of which included um, Adonis. Adonis was primarily a semi-god associated with beauty, desire, regeneration and rejuvenation religious cults religious cult was also related to the second seasonal cycle and to the art um, agri um agricultural um calendar sorry festivals feasts and celebrations were the most common worship cult in addition to these larger festivals smaller ceremonies were used to mark a variety of occasions in the public and private life of a citizen including their birthday marriage and death the templates uh, rather the temples had festivals corresponding to the changes of the season they worshiped the energy shown by nature in destroying and reproducing life it was a place for festivities for instance dancing and singing formed one of the chief characteristics of worship priesthood appears to have been a hereditary position drawn from the ranks of the uh, aristocracy the main duties of a Phoenician priest were to supervise religious ceremonies and festivals and offer regular sacrifices to the gods in updating the temple library. The cultic life of a Phoenician city revolved around a calendar of feasts, festivals, and celebrations. Mm, quite interesting. We did a video talking about the origins of the feast, the feast days. You know how you hear... You know, particularly Hebrews saying we got to keep the feast days. We got to keep the feast days. Well, we talked about where those feast days actually came from. And this is once again, it's pointing to that. And if you think that these feast days was something that was handed to Moses and then from Moses, we had that they were inspired by something beyond the storyline that we find in the Bible. All right. It goes a lot further than that. All right. And so anyway, let's continue. The Phoenicians divided their cult leader, their cult leader, wow, their cult calendar into 12 lunar months. You notice that just like the, you know, uh, the, the, the feast days in the Bible are aligned with the lunar calendar, we find that the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians, they also did the same thing. And the Phoenicians predate what we find in the Bible, all right? Uh, as far as their culture and stuff is concerned. Uh, Phoenician real, religious life, and, is, and, and it appears in the popularity of the Phoenician name, um, and then they give um, 
B-N-H-D. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Sun of the new moon. Another significant date in the Phoenician calendar was the new year. Phoenician New Year celebrations were held in the month of Parita, February and March. Music and dancing were important features of the Phoenician cult worship. Drums and tambourines were also used. Another important way of divining the future was the consolation of oracles. Water, libations, and the burning of incense was an important part of the cultic life of the sanctuary. The most common type of libation consisted of a mixture of wine and water, oil, milk, honey. Philo of Byblos suggested that the Phoenicians believed in some form of afterlife. The lotus flower was often used to represent the protection and renewal of the spirit. Um, let's see. Inhumation was one of the main forms of burial practice during the, um, um, sorry, the late Bronze Age. The Phoenicians constructed two types of temple, the open air precinct and the built enclosed temple. Open air precincts consisted of a paved open courtyard with the house, the altar um, or betel or sacred stone. Open air complexes tended to be elevated by means of a built platform. Temples had ceremonial basin. Same thing you find in the Bible. Okay, the enclosed temple had a central temple or chapel, a large open courtyard, and an ornate um, portico through which the site was entered. All right, it goes on here. What I will do is I will put the, the link in the uh, description below so that you can read this. There's a lot in here, but they really break it down as far as like what these people believed and what it was about. Okay, so just for it out of the interest of time and, you know, knowing that we're in the age of TikTok where people's attention kind of clocks out after a few minutes. So I just want to make sure I don't lose people here. Um, do I have anything else that I can show you here? Hold on. Anything else that I had that it was mentioning here? I think that's, that was it. All the main stuff here. Like I said, I'll put the link in the description so that you can follow along. You can read for yourself and you can keep, you know, add to your own research. So, so again, as we've been saying on this platform, when you take a look at Christianity in of itself, you will see that when you begin to start deconstructing and looking at it, you know, from multiple angles and not just saying this, you know, like the song says, God said it, I believe it. And that settles it. And I'm not going to question anything about it. Once you begin to start delving in and going beyond that narrative and beginning to investigate on your own and to start looking at the, looking at other historical accounts, factual historical accounts, you know, from people, especially that have gone out into the field and are looking and bringing back you know, the resources and saying, hey, this is where we found these are the artifacts that we found in this area. You know, those are the resources that you want to pull from, you know, so that you can, you know, say, OK, I think we got something here. But if you think for one moment that your claim can just overshadow all of that, then you are the biggest fool on that. You know, so your your whatever you want to claim. So even if someone wants to say, you know, for people who say, well, you know, hey, the original people you know they were black the, all these people that we just discussed here you know the town the city and all that the whole town of byblos was black okay fine okay if you want to settle on that okay fine the next layer that a lot of people don't want to go into is let's look at the practices of these individuals all right so what we've learned is regardless if you're a christian or if you're a hebrew the word bible in of itself is in effect dedicated to a Canaanite deity. It's dedicated to a Canaanite deity. Baal, that's where it comes from, all right? So I hope you got something out of this. And, um, and like I said, I would encourage you again to go check out our series, Who in the L Are You Following? It's a series that, like, you know, in this video, I'm, hitting about 40 minutes right now at this point in the video. Some of those videos, I'm gonna tell you right now, they're like two and a half, maybe even three hours long. It's that much information, but it's a lot of information that is needed as we kind of go through this thing step by step. Because again, particularly for us as um, descendants of Africans that were brought over as slaves, it's imperative for you to begin to look at this thing closer. Because again, 
what was given to you was not something you brought. You did not bring the Bible with you on slave ships. Your ancestors did not do that. Your ancestors were not calling out on the name Jesus in slave ships. They were not worshiping Jesus. The first time they heard the name Jesus was by way of the um, the uh, the colonizers, the Europeans that came over. We're going to do another video where we're going to talk about um, that first interaction, because, again, when people want to say that Christianity was something that was being practiced all over uh, the continent of Africa, you know, it was something that was birthed in Africa, but it was birthed in Egypt. That's where it came out in Egypt. Egypt is Africa. Correct. Correct. But here's the thing. Who was in control in Egypt at that time? It was Greeks and it was also Romans. All right. So that's how Christianity was birthed out of that. They use Africa only as a as a launching pad, if you will. But when you start going into Central South Africa, they knew nothing about Jesus. They knew nothing about Christianity. They knew nothing. If you look at the, the paths of the apostles that after, you know, when Jesus in the Bible, you know, so, you know, gave the Great Commission, said go into all the world and preach the gospel. They didn't go down in Central South Africa for some reason, even though it was right there. They went all in Europe. They went in those areas and in Mediterranean. If you follow the tracks where they went, they went all there, but they didn't go Central South Africa. Gee, I wonder why. And then the answer to that, we look to the Pope in um, in Portugal, who basically said anywhere else you go, Central South Africa um, and what we call today Central America or the Americas, I would say, period. Anybody else outside of that area was considered enemies of Christ. And they came by way of the sword and by the whip. That's how the good news came to us. So if you're going to have a discussion about, you know, uh, Christianity and its origins, we have to make sure that we're looking at all of it, starting with the name Bible. Family, thank you so much for tuning in. You guys take care and we'll be talking again soon.